literally creates replicas of other cities, puts them in hotels, and then makes it affordable for regular Americans to go visit Paris or Venice. Everybody here's got a supercomputer in their pocket. Most of you flew here on a jet, all comfortably seated and accessing the internet at 30,000 feet and moving it over 500 miles per hour. And you probably complained when the internet wasn't fast enough. And that's how good things are in this country. It is the greatest time in history to be a human being. Look, do we ever ask ourselves why that is? Really, why? Uh, I don't need you to answer yet. But, <laughs> but why, why should we be grateful? One thing's for sure, we don't sound very grateful as a society, as a country. I was dumbstruck the other day. I was reading a comment by a 29-year-old journalist. She was the one who wrote the Time Magazine cover piece that uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was on. This young journalist said something really bizarre. She said, our generation, meaning millennials, our generation has never known American prosperity. This is an insane comment. Yesterday, another jobs report came out. Newsflash, America is doing pretty great. Wages are up. There's actually too many jobs. Free people and free markets, unencumbered by the heavy hand of government. Turns out that actually works. <laughs> and yet, yet, we find ourselves in this era of incredible prosperity. We find ourselves fighting off the lies of socialism. If there is one fundamental thing that I think the Republican Party stands for, I believe it is this. It's gratitude. We gather here because we're grateful. We're grateful for a country that enshrined and protected God-given rights into our governing system and cherished the timeless principles of limited government, liberty, sovereignty, the sovereignty of the individual and country, protection of property rights, and the notion that God is the ultimate moral authority. Where did we get those ideas from? Our founders didn't make them up. No, our founding documents didn't create those principles. They simply enshrined them. It was just the first time that humanity had actually written down all of the best ideas that humankind had ever had. Where did they come from? They came from the lessons of Jerusalem, Athens, Rome, and London, and then we all wrote them down in Philadelphia. But it all began in Jerusalem. Western civilization, human prosperity, it exists because of the lessons of Jerusalem where we learned what moral truth was. So you can't have a free society without moral truth, morality derived from God. Because if it isn't derived from God, then by de definition, morality is just a human opinion. And human opinions can change. And when humans' opinions can change on morality, when secularist socialism ensues, you get the worst atrocities the world has ever seen. The terror of the French Revolution, communism, hundreds of millions dead, and the Holocaust. If this isn't the single greatest reason to protect our ally Israel, then I don't know what is. Our histories are interconnected. They're more so than anybody really realizes today. And yet that critical relationship is under attack. Anti-Semitism has been normalized in the U.S. House of Representatives. Israel has long been besieged by the great farce that is the United Nations Human Rights Council. But it is only recently that we now must look internally as well. Because within our own American ranks, there are those who want to see Israel's demise. We're never going to let that happen. We will continue to fight for Israel within the UN. We must act to check Iran's influence and ensure that Hezbollah does not gain ground that could threaten Israel. We will fight against the dangerous and anti-Semitic BDS movement. We will continue to ensure that Israel maintains its military edge. And I, I would say, as politicians have been saying for years, I would say that we would finally recognize the true capital of Israel, Jerusalem, and finally recognize that the Golan Heights belongs to Israel do you know what? Our president already did that.
But as you know, it's not just our policies towards Israel that are being questioned. It's everything. We find ourselves having to defend basic notions of the free market, the right to defend ourselves in our own homes, or even the underlying idea that America is inherently good. The culture war is in full force, and it's a war against the very principles that made our country so great. Let me give you an example. Out in California, a woman named Celeste Barber, she used to work for the Santa Barbara Community College Board, and she was protesting the fact that they no longer did the Pledge of Allegiance at their hearings. And as she was giving her peace, she picked up a little flag like many of you have, and she started saying the Pledge of Allegiance. Meanwhile, angry leftists, who somehow knew she was going to do this, I guess, and came to protest her, they screamed at her. They snarled at her. And with tears in her eyes, she continued to give the Pledge of Allegiance. She didn't know what was going on with her country. She didn't recognize it. That's the culture war. There's a movement that truly hates this country, and they're within, and we have to fight them. We found her, by the way, and we invited her to do the next Pledge of Allegiance at the biggest event we can find in Washington, D.C., and she accepted, so it's going to be really exciting to have her up in D.C. There's a real philosophical difference in how the left and the right view government and our culture at large, and I find it useful to illustrate those differences because it helps us as conservatives explain why we advocate for our policies and why our approach to governance is the right one. And I think it boils down to this. There's a fundamental difference in how we view human nature. The left generally believes that human nature can be perfected. There's a utopian ideal of how individuals should behave and they will relentlessly enforce that ideal on the collective. The problem, of course, is that we always have to ask ourselves, what is good? And since they don't define good or moral based on any kind of absolute authority like God, then good is whatever they decide in the moment. And that's a real problem. That's why it's not the right governing philosophy. And you see this manifest itself on college campuses where conservative speech is shouted down. And you see it in the relentless pursuit of centralized government control because the ends justify the means. They have a utopia, and it doesn't matter how they get there. Even scarier than that, the left has begun to pursue identity politics to achieve that power. They pit different groups against each other. They divide them up into categories of victims and oppressors, and then label themselves as the champions of the oppressed. They promise different groups more power over other groups, by feeding resentment and division. It's tearing us apart as a country. Conservatives have a more realistic understanding of human nature. And it can evolve, sure, human nature can, but it certainly doesn't happen by force of government. We respect the sanctity of the individual and content of your character, not the color of your skin, because the only colors that actually matter to us are the red, white, and blue. Conservatives value decentralized government, not centralized government, and we value local control over the policies that affect our lives because New Yorkers shouldn't have to live like Texans and vice versa. Although I think everybody should want to live like Texans, but you know. <laughs> we believe that people should be free to self-govern and never be forced to succumb to policies crafted by supposedly benevolent academics sitting up in Washington. And there is nothing more conceited than the belief that small groups of experts can create the perfect one-size-fits-all policies. It is grounded in a wrong-headed belief that you find meaning, purpose, and morality in government. Well, you don't. And like I said before, our morality doesn't come from government.
yet to tell people about the cultural underpinnings that drive the politics. Policy is downstream of politics, and politics is downstream of the culture. So we better start fighting for the cultural principles that have made our country so great. Personal responsibility, mental toughness, and discipline, love of our countries, and the ideals that bring us together, moral virtue that comes from God, not government, and more liberty, not less. Just the basics, nothing you haven't heard before, but we haven't been doing a good job actually defending them and explaining why they are so important. Because if we value liberty, and I think we do, and I believe it's worth pointing out that you can't have liberty without all those other values I just listed. They're firmly woven into the cultural narratives that we tell ourselves to keep our society alive and sustainable. Because if you're not personally responsible, Tough. If you're not mentally tough, you can't possibly survive in a free, competitive society. And if you're not personally responsible, then by definition you believe others should be responsible for you, thus infringing on their freedoms, so say goodbye to liberty. And if you can't take personal responsibility, then it is highly unlikely that you would take responsibility for the country or feel any sense of loyalty towards that country, so say goodbye to another foundational bedrock, loyalty to your own nation. And if we aren't loyalty to our own country, then why not advocate for open border policies? See, those policies are always downstream of the initial cultural narrative. And finally, if we're not a moral people without, with, with concrete, unchangeable virtues, then how on earth can we be trusted with freedom? All of these elements, they build on one another. They're required. That's how all of this started. Everything you see around you, it's why we're in the middle of a desert with all the food and water and booze that we could ever want. <laughs> it's amazing, it's a miracle. These principles, they created the miracle that is Western civilization, and yet they're being clawed away at. We, conservatives, must remind Americans that the countercultural values of the left can only exist as a weight on the back of traditional values. Taking responsibility for others, as the socialist wants, can only occur on the backs of people who first take responsibility for themselves. It is up to conservatives to remind Americans that our country is indeed a compilation of the best ideas that humankind ever had. The lessons of Jerusalem, of Rome, of Athens, and London that were encapsulated in Philadelphia by the U.S. Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution. We wrote down our inalienable rights and said that the government's purpose was simply to protect those rights, not create more. And that's why we gathered here this weekend. Because if we don't define our own principles and remind the world why they matter and why they are correct, then we lose the spirit of this American experiment. It's not necessarily encoded into our DNA what the Founding Fathers wrote down. In fact, what is in our DNA as people is tribalism, it's hatred, it's clawing at one another, it's kind of what you see around right now. The Enlightenment principles that made our country great are something we constantly have to educate our youth about and constantly fight for. We gather here because we are gonna fight for those and we're not about to let them go. America, America is the greatest idea that anybody has ever had. We're not, allowed to, we're not about to let it be squandered. God bless you all. Thank you for having me. Enjoy your weekend here. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our final speaker of the day,